Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last three lectures of EC3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at some two transistor amplifier configurations. In this lecture, we'll look at an example of a two transistor configuration that's a lot more complicated in many ways than the ones we've looked at already. And this is an amplifier configuration called the CAS code. So, in the CAS code, we basically have a common emitter configuration followed by a common base configuration. But there's some weirdness in terms of how everything is biased here. So we now have three resistors at the front here handling the biasing instead of the usual two. And so this resistor out here associated with bypassing this emitter resistance, I'm now calling R4. We used to call it R3. Now, we have our usual structure here in terms of analyzing it and that this RS here is considered to be the output impedance of the voltage source driving the amp and not part of the amp itself. Similarly, I've placed an external load resistance RL here that the amplifier is driving. This is not considered part of the amplifier itself. As usual, we split this into our DC bias circuit and our small signal quote unquote AC circuit. For the DC circuit, we open up all of the capacitors. And for the small signal circuit, for now we're going to assume that the capacitors act as shorts. And later in the class, I'll show you ways of treating the capacitors more carefully and looking at their effect on the frequency response of the circuit. The other thing I've done here is I've taken this configuration of resistors down here and I've replaced it with RTE1. So here that's just RE in parallel with R4. And if you have some other resistor configuration down here, you can replace it with whatever's appropriate here, no problem. All right, so let's take a look at the DC circuit. So let's write a KVL equation as we've done before in terms of a Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base of Q1 and out of the emitter of Q1. So we have VBB1, that's the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of base one, minus the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the emitter, minus the base emitter voltage drop that we're assuming for Q1. And on the other side, we have the current expressed here multiplied by Thevenin equivalent resistances looking out of the base and the emitter. So I'm going to use superposition to think about the contributions to VBB1. We have our power supplies V plus and V minus, and we can also consider the current flowing into the base of Q2 as acting as its own independent current source. This is legitimate using Marshall Leach's ideas of superposition with dependent sources. We're sort of treating them as independent sources, but we're making sure we don't actually try to solve for any of the variables until we've included all of the various contributions in the analysis. So if I consider these three sources in turn, well, when I think about V plus, I imagine grounding V minus using superposition, and then I would open up this independent current source. So I just have a voltage divider where I'm dividing the voltage over R3. I have a similar scenario where I think about grounding V plus to look at the effect of V minus, except now the division is happening over a resistance of R1 in series with R2. So as far as this current source is concerned, I can imagine grounding both of my supply voltages here and now I'll think about this in two steps. I want to think about what the current flowing up this direction is. And remember, we're cutting the wire here when computing a Thevenin equivalent voltage. Well, I have a current divider. And for a current divider, I want to include in the numerator the resistance of the branch that I'm not analyzing. So I'm looking at the R2, R3 branch. So I use the resistance R1 in the numerator. All right, that gives us a current, but in order to figure out what the influence is on the voltage, well, I need to multiply by R3 to get the voltage according to Ohm's law. And I know that I want a minus sign here because this arrow is pulling current out of the node. So we could compute IB2 in terms of IE2, the current flowing out of Q2, 
And conveniently, the emitter current for Q2 is the same as the collector current for Q1. So I can imagine replacing IB2 with IE2 over beta 2 plus 1, but IE2 is the same as IC1. So instead of writing IE2 here, I'll just go ahead and write IC1 here. All right, now I can take this VBB and plug it into here. But I also need these resistances. So computing the resistance looking out of the base of Q1, I zero out my independent sources here, or at least the sources I'm thinking of as independent. And so I just have a parallel combination of R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3. And as far as the Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out the emitter of Q1 goes, well, I just have a voltage of V minus and a resistance of RE. So again, I can take these various quantities and plug them into the appropriate places here. And if I do that, I wind up with an expression that looks like this. And here, what I did in order to try to get this all written on one slide, I created this VBB1 with a tilde. And basically, that is this VBB1, but without this last term. So I express this as the VBB1 with a tilde minus that IC1, rest of that mess. And then I have the rest of the stuff over here. Okay, so then I can take this term with IC1 on the left and move it over to the other side to write an expression like this. And then I can factor out IC1 from all of these terms. And then if I divide by what I get when I factor out the IC1, I wind up with this expression. Now this isn't actually that much more complicated than the expression we had for simple one transistor stages using a resistor divider bias scheme. Notice we're able to do all of this without actually having to write any separate equations for Q2. And that's convenient because essentially the emitter current of Q2 is forced to be a certain value by the collector of Q1. And if you want to simplify this expression a little bit, if you can assume that beta 2 is big, then you can basically leave out this term here. And essentially what you're doing there is you're assuming that this current IB2 is small. And then the resulting expression looks a lot like expressions that we've seen before. Okay, so once you have IC1, then you can compute IE2, and then you can use your alpha and beta relations to get the various other bias currents. And at that point, you plug your bias currents into your various expressions for the raw input and output impedance and the raw resistance and the raw transconductance of your two transistors, and you use those values in the remaining analysis. As usual, I'll be using a set of Norton and Thevenin equivalent circuits we computed looking into the terminals of the small signal model of the BJT in terms of Thevenin equivalents looking out of the other terminals. So you'll want to check out those lectures if you haven't already. And you'll also want to check out these lectures where I first apply those equivalent circuits to basic one transistor amplifier types. Particularly for this lecture, you'll want to make sure you see the lecture on the common emitter amplifier and the common base amplifier. And you want to make sure you go to Marshall Leach's Analog Electronics class website, click on BJT Formula Sheet, and download and print out this sheet that summarizes the various Norton and Thevenin equivalent circuits we use. The formulas here are pretty general and awfully complicated. We'll generally be using these R0 approximation formulas. So we assume R0 and the small signal model of the BGT is infinite, except when we're computing the resistance looking into the collector. Okay, to compute the gain, we'll pull out a Mason flow graph. And again, you don't have to use a Mason flow graph. It's just a really convenient way to organize the computations. And later when we look at feedback amplifiers, these Mason flow graphs are definitely handy. Anyway, tracing through the circuit variables, if I think about the Norton equivalent circuit looking into Q2 and think about the short circuit current for that, then I could compute the output here by multiplying this current by a parallel combination of RC, RL, 
and the resistance seen looking into the collector called RIC2. And we know we need a minus sign here because the arrow would indicate that we're pulling current out of the node. So what's IC2? Well, that could be written as IE2 times alpha. And an important note to make here is I am making that R0 approximation, so we're not thinking about primes or anything. We can directly deal with emitter and collector currents without worrying about what's flowing through any sort of r naughts. All right, but what's IE2? Well, that's going to equal IC1 because I have IC1 basically forcing IE2 to be a certain value. So we'll put alpha 2 here. Oh, I should have said that this is really alpha 2. Our transistors could have different alphas. All right, so what's IC1? Well, I can get that from the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base by multiplying by our big capital G M factor for Q1. And what's the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base? I can get it from Vs through a voltage divider. So I'll have Rs in the denominator plus a bunch of stuff and that bunch of stuff in the numerator. And what is that bunch of stuff? Well, it's this parallel combination of R3 with R2. So we're going to need big GM1 and little r IC2. And to compute these things, we need a lot of intermediate results. We're going to need the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base. So to compute that, I short this independent source. So I have a parallel combination of RS, R3, and R2. We're also going to need RTB2, which is the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base of Q2. And the schematic would suggest that should just be zero. But I would like to also include the possibility of there being some base spreading resistance, which will represent as a little r x2. That's something that's really internal to the small signal model of Q2, but you might as well model it as an external resistance here, little r x2, if you have it. And if you look on Marshall Leach's formula sheet, he always writes RTB plus rx, RTB plus rx, RTB plus rx over and over. I tend to just write RTB and say, okay, you'll have a new RTB where you add that RX to it if you need to. So you can use whichever convention you want. Okay, so RIE1 is the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking up into the emitter of Q1. RIE2 is the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking up into the emitter of Q2. And these are expressed in terms of these capital RTBs that we computed up here. We have two different versions, one with R pi that sort of drops out of the pi model and one with R e that drops out of using the T model, but you can easily convert one to the other. And let's see, we're also going to need these resistances looking into the bases. And those resistances seen looking into the base are specified in terms of resistances seen looking out of the emitters. So looking out of the emitter of Q1, we had a parallel combination of RE and R4, although you could replace this with whatever combination of resistors you have for your particular circuit. Now, what about the equivalent resistance seen looking out of the emitter of Q2? Well, that's gonna be the resistance seen looking into the collector of Q1, which is RIC1. So we need the formulas for big GM and little RIC for one and two, and those are reviewed here. So we have five different choices of formulas for GM. We have two different choices of formulas for RIC, and you can put in the various numbers like ones, one, one, and you can put in two, two, or you can put in one, one, you can put in the other numbers in the subscript you need to get the values for the different transistors. Okay, so to actually compute the small signal voltage gain, I can just take these factors and multiply them together. And in terms of simplifying this, assume that RS was zero, then this whole term would go to one. And at that point, you can just ignore this term entirely. 
if we could also assume that R, I, C, and R, L are infinite, then I'm just left with GM1 times alpha 2 times RC. And alpha 2 is often pretty close to 1, so the resulting answer is usually pretty close to just GM1 times RC. And that's basically the gain you get from a common emitter. But this is not necessarily super simple because there may be some weirdness hiding in the formula for GM1. What about the output impedance? As usual, we'll compute that looking into this junction of RC and the collector of Q2, and we're not going to include RL in our analysis because that's not considered part of the amplifier. So that output resistance is going to be RC in parallel with RIC2, which is the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector of Q2. So as far as I can tell, people usually just assume that RIC2 is infinite, and they just say the output impedance is capital RC, or something pretty close to that. But let's try to work it out in detail. So RIC2 is this big mess here. At least this is one of the possible formulas. There's another equivalent formula. Now, in order to compute this, we're going to need RTB2. All right, so what about... RTE2. Well, that's RIC1. That's the equivalent resistance seen looking into Q1. We need RIB1, which is given by this expression here. So that's not too complicated. What is RIC1? Well, that's given by this mess here. And for that, I'm going to need RTB1 and RTE1. Anyway, let's talk about the input impedance. As usual, we'll compute it looking in here, so we're not going to compute it using RS because that's considered part of the source driving the amplifier and not part of the amplifier itself. All right, so the input impedance is going to be R3 in parallel with RIB1, which is the resistance seen looking into Q1, in parallel with R2, and what's RIB1? Well, that's pretty easy. RTE1 is just that parallel combination of resistors down here, RE in parallel with R4. If you go to Marshall's Analog Electronics class website and scroll down to find his notes on the BJT and then search for this example on the Cascode and then scroll up a little bit to find his schematic, you'll see he works this out in a fairly abstract way. So he defines the input impedance as looking into this Thevenin equivalent resistance RTB. So he's computing it from the point of view of the Thevenin voltage source and not the original voltage source VS. So he comes up with a slightly different answer. And one of my frustrations in preparing this lecture is that in his particular analysis here, he works everything out in this fairly abstract way, whereas I'm trying to work it out in a much more specific example. So I don't really have an independent verification of my results, so I'm a little less confident in them. And if you find any errors in my analysis, please do leave a comment below and let me know, and I'll take a look at it. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, if alpha 2 is close to 1, the total gain is not really that much different than the gain you get from a common emitter stage. So why would you want to use this complex configuration if you could get away with just using a regular common emitter kind of structure, like you could get rid of Q2 here and just pull everything down? Well, thinking back to the common emitter amplifier, we'll see later that a more detailed model of the transistor includes a parasitic capacitance between the base and the collector, and this parasitic capacitance essentially forms a feedback loop from the output back to the input, which can really mess things up, particularly at high frequencies. So this is a problem, especially in RF kind of systems. In a Cascode configuration, the second transistor essentially decouples the input from the output.